please pause the video and try out this question before listening on. One of the keys to solving this question is as follows. The tension in the string, it turns out, does not exert a torque on the puck. And in that situation, we can use the conservation of angular momentum. That might warrant further explanation. How do we know that the tension in the string is not exerting a torque on the puck? Well, if we look at the diagram, we can see that the tension in the string would be pointing downward as this person pulls down on the string. And if we look at that carefully, we'll notice then that that tension, T, is passing right through the axis of rotation of the puck. And any time a force passes directly through the axis of rotation, it does not exert a torque. And so from that diagram, we can see indeed that the tension, since it's passing through the axis of rotation, does not exert a torque, and therefore we can use the conservation of angular momentum. So let's look at that equation. Now in this equation, I represents the moment of inertia of the object, which in this case is the puck, and the omegas, which look like w's, is the angular velocity of the puck. Now it turns out that the moment of inertia for an object like a puck is mass times its radius squared. That usually applies if the object is a particle, and it's safe to assume that because the puck is so small, it essentially acts as a particle. So what we need to do is replace the i terms in this equation with mass times radius squared. Notice that we've included a subscript i to represent the initial radius of the puck's motion and a subscript f to represent its final radius. Since mass appears on both sides of the equation, we can cancel it out. And then we can start to think about what quantities are given to us in this problem. We can see that the original distance that the puck is from the center of rotation is 40 centimeters. So what that means is the initial radius, or ri, is equal to 40 centimeters. The question goes on to tell us that the string is pulled downward by 15 centimeters. Hopefully it's understandable that as the string gets pulled downward by 15 centimeters, then this length of string right here will also shrink by 15 centimeters. Recall that its original length from the puck to the center was 40, and if we pull down on the string and that causes that string to shrink by 15 centimeters, that means that the final radius is going to be 25 centimeters. Make sure that makes sense. You might want to rewind and listen to that one more time. So we've plugged in the two radii, the final and the initial. Now in a sense, we also know the initial angular velocity, but they gave it to us in a bit of an indirect way. They told us that the puck is initially moving with a speed of 80 centimeters per second. And it turns out that it's very possible to convert that speed of 80 centimeters per second into an angular speed. So let's look at the equation that relates angular speed, which is omega, to the speed given. We can see that angular speed is equal to the regular speed, if you will, sometimes called a tangential speed, divided by the radius of the object's path. Now we were given that speed as 80 centimeters per second, so we can plug that into the equation. And then again, the initial radius of the puck's path was given to us as 40 centimeters. So when we simplify this, we can see that we get 2, 80 divided by 40 is 2, and the unit for angular speed will be radians per second. The centimeters will cancel, and essentially what's left over is a per second, that little division line, and then seconds, but that essentially is radians per second. So if you ever work one of these problems and you end up with a per second like this, just make sure you understand that that's equivalent to radians per second. So that would represent the initial angular speed, and we can plug that in to the formula. So as we can see, we can solve for the final angular speed, and to do that, all we need to do is divide both sides of the equation by 25 centimeters squared, make sure it's squared, and also make sure that when you perform the calculation, you square the 40 and square the 25. The centimeters are gonna cancel, and you should get 5.12 radians per second for the final angular speed. Now you might be wondering why do we care about the final angular speed? Well, let's turn to that next. But actually before doing that, let's just remind ourselves that the initial angular speed was two radians per second. So it turns out that we're now ready to calculate the work that's being done on the puck. And that's because the work done on the puck is simply equal to the final kinetic energy of the puck minus the initial kinetic energy of the puck. In this case, that kind of kinetic energy is rotational kinetic energy because the puck is spinning in a circular trajectory. 
what we can do is replace the kinetic energies with their corresponding expressions for rotational motion. So here they are. Notice how similar they are to the sort of traditional equation for kinetic energy when we have one half times mass times velocity squared. Because this object is moving in a rotational fashion, we have to replace mass with this rotational inertia or moment of inertia and replace the speed with an angular speed. But otherwise, they're the same kind of formula. Now let's remember that the moment of inertia for a puck or other particle-like object can be replaced with the expression mass times radius squared. And now the rest essentially is just plugging into the formula. Note that the mass was given to us as 0.12 kilograms. We had already figured out the final angular speed and the initial angular speed. And then the radii were mentioned earlier. Just be sure that you plug in meters here for the radii. Recall that the final radius was 25 centimeters, but we're going to have to use the standard unit of 0.25 meters. And then the initial radius was 40 centimeters, but we're again going to use the standard unit of meters, so that will become 0.4 meters. So with that initial radius, final radius, and all the other known values, we can plug in. Now I've decided to omit the units because it kind of would clutter up this uh, expression, this equation. But just be, you know, rest assured that as long as everything is in the standard units of kilograms, meters, as well as radians per second, then everything's going to sort of work out. And the final unit for work is going to be joules. And the value after you plug that mess into your calculator turns out to be 5.99 times 10 to the minus 2 joules. Or if you prefer in decimal form, it would be 0 0.0599 joules. So either form is the correct answer. So thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you like what you saw, please subscribe and stay tuned for additional videos that show solutions to commonly assigned physics, calculus, chemistry, and other subjects.